again, it's time for the White Clover Meat Sab Hour. Brought to you by the people who believe. Bring it up there. And, Dad, if you're going to hear any sap like we're going to give out for the next 45 minutes, man, you're a real sap lover. <laughs> oh, what a terrible person. <laughs> All right, that's enough of that. That's enough of that. Oh, one of the saddest stories I've heard in a long time. Did you hear about this chick that was a singer who got fired from the Lawrence Welk show? Did you hear about that? She didn't show up? No, I'm serious. Uh, her name is Natalie Nevins. Now, I'll be perfectly frank, I'm not a uh, Lawrence Welk fan, but the Natalie Nevins was bounced off the show. And, the, you know, he says, one, two, uh, you are out. And the, she was. Kicked her right out. And, of course, she flipped. And uh, we're going to quote her now. I like this little bit. This is a talk about a moment of t- sheer terror. You see, she's been bounced. She was been bounced out. She says, when I tried to take Mr. Welk some blueberry muffins I had baked for him, in an attempt to get my job back, about eight armed guards came out to stop me. <laughs> a one, a, a two, a, a go and get her. Then uh, one. <laughs> Oh, I tell you, that's that's a kid, uh, fellows, friends, fellow victims out there, male types. Can you imagine getting kicked out of your job? I mean, you're fired, see, and so you go home in a pet, and uh, you sit around your house, and old Bullard, you know, who fired you, CG, he's uh, he's sitting in his office. You know, well, the thing that CG is so famous about, I mean, I, I suppose all of you know that uh, Mr. Bullard, who was the ultimate and was a quintessential boss. He's the top boss of all time. Mr. Bullard is famous for pulling his own teeth. And uh, so, so old C.G. is sitting behind his giant Danish walnut desk, you know, with the, with the lion's feet for claws and all that. He's sitting there, and he throws you out. He says, uh, he says uh, Fred, we believe that we do not have, we do not have a, an organization here that gives you scope enough for your potentialities. Meaning, this ain't a bookie office, and uh, you know <laughs> we're not a bookie here, and we don't have time here while you're running in and out all afternoon pretending you're going down to chock full of nuts, and what you're doing is laying bets on what's happening at Belmont. Now, Fred, uh, uh, you drop by down at the uh, personnel department, and they'll give you your check. We're giving you three days, uh, eight, and uh, of course you realize that uh, you weren't here long enough to earn a vacation, and uh, get out of here. And so you go home. Can you imagine baking a pan of fudge? to come back and said, Mr. Bullard. <laughs> no wonder eight armed guards came out after her. Would you please? A one, a two, a one, a two. A one, a two. One, a two, a one, a two. And tonight, we're going to salute Lawrence Welk and his uh, labor methods. Which horse is in midstream now? Watch this. I pick up another juicer. old folks out there, but I sure enjoy it. I mean, after all, what's life about? Now, uh, would you, uh, I'll tell you, what, what do you got on that thing? You got the Oriental Strut, that was what we were just listening to. Uh, do you have, uh, on that side is, uh, I just feel like playing a little bit here. Uh, how about, how about taking me out the uh, Songs of the Whiskey Rebellion there? 
ways, if you will. Have you ever wondered what these ads are about? Have you ever seen these ads with a guy looking out of the ad at you in the back of a pulp magazine? And he says, why do you want $3,500? And above it says, in a little balloon, it says, I will give $3,500 cash to some person who answers my announcement. You may be the one to get it. But before I give it to anyone, I would like to know how wisely this money will be spent. Quote, why do you want $3,500? Tell me in 20 words or less, and you, and that's a great big you, you will be qualified for the opportunity to win this big fortune. Signed, Tom Wood. And, and, and the, at no point do they tell you why. There's a whole full-page ad that says, cash, I'll pay $250 just for the winning answer. Have you... All the things you want in life, a motor car, a beautiful home, fine clothes, money for a vacation or an enjoyable trip, to start a business for yourself, to give yourself or someone a higher education, or for a safe investment for a rainy day or old age. Why do you want $3,500? It is a fortune, right? This very minute, it will suggest much to you. What could you do? All you got to do is write to this guy and tell him why you want dough, and he'll send it to you. He doesn't say what else he'll send. <laughs> I don't know. Listen to this ad here. This is a great ad. Do you know that in those days, when this magazine was published, you could get a blank cartridge pistol for one dollar? No, one dollar. One dollar. And uh, here you can get a, uh, it says, be a big entertainer. Make it big on the radio. 180 jokes and riddles. I kind of like that. That's good. 15 cents. It says, guaranteed, absolute satisfaction guaranteed. Also, the name of seven good agents will be sent to you if you write within the next 20 minutes. How about this one? Learn how to hypnotize beauties in your spare time. Oh, that's terrible. Hypnotize beauties in your spare time. Oh, you know, here you are. You're sitting in your, uh, you know, your 1932 Willie's Durant. And uh, you look at her, and she, she looks at you, and you say, Look into my eyes, my proud beauty. And she looks into your eyes, see? You say, Oh, Allah Kazam, oh, you will do my bidding. You now imagine you are fantastically in love with me, and you were willing to give me anything. And then she's swatching them out. Bump, ba -dum, bump, bump. Of course, you get your money back. Satisfaction, not guaranteed. Now, let's see. What else do we have here? Oh, yeah, what's this one? It says, I, I've seen these ads. I remember when I was a kid, I used to read these ads all the time. See, there's a, it shows this guy kissing his chick. It's a big, full-page, serious ad. And above it, it says, Know the amazing truth about sex. The amazing truth. Holy smokes. The forbidden secrets of sex are daringly revealed. You must be over 21 to get this book, which daringly reveals the secrets of sex. More than 100 vivid pictures. Whoo! Boy, oh boy. Has it ever occurred to you that there's large numbers of people in this world who believe that sex is a spectator sport? <laughs> I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> yeah, Warriors. Yeah, I like, kind of like this one. Shows a guy with a gigantic muscle. And he is bulging. What a muscle. His muscle, I'll tell you, he's got arms that look like his arms are filled with inflated basketballs. Tremendous muscles. And he is breaking a chain. Have you ever seen that? that where he's busting a chain with his biceps. He has, he has made his muscles so hard that a giant chain, it's got links about eight inches across, he's breaking a chain, see? And it says, I will add two inches to your biceps, or it will not cost one cent. Oh, listen, I bet there's 5,000 guys out there right now listening to me who wrote for one of those catalogs, you know, the, the one that says, uh, in just seven days, I will prove to you that you can be a new man. Has that bully at the beach been kicking sand in your face? And then there's a little comic strip. It shows uh, George L. was a 27-pound weakling. And you see him standing in front of the mirror, and he's got pimples. 27-pound weakling. And George L., was constantly at the mercy of the bullies at the beach. And it shows him sitting on this plank, and he's got little skinny knees, knobs all over, you know. And you see this big bully. He's got wavy hair, and he's kicking sand in this guy's face. And he's saying to George's girl, come on, baby. And what a girl. What like Sophia Leroy. Come on, baby. And in the last picture, you see this villain, you know, with gigantic muscles. And George is sitting there, and tears are coming down. And then underneath it, it says, and then George discovered our seven-day course in a magazine just like the one you are reading. And you see George sitting there, and he's saying, by George. He always used to say, that's why they call him George, see? He says, by George, I'll send for this. And it shows the mailman arriving, a big grin. You know, they always show the big grin on the mailman. He says, George, your course has arrived. And George says, great, Scott, just in time for the prom. 
And uh, the next scene, <laughs> you see George, and he's looking in front of the mirror, and he's got this spring, you know, with the handles on it, and he's something, doing something with the spring, see? And he's standing in front of the mirror, and you see already, it says five minutes later, already you can see gigantic muscles look like, he, you know, he's like he's got tennis balls in his back and all this, tremendous muscle. And it says, sometime later, seven days, George absolutely proved to himself that he could be a new man. And it says, sometime later, and you see this gigantic monster sitting on the beach. Hell, oh, he's got shoulders. He, I mean, he looks like uh, Emerson Boozer, you know, tremendous muscles. And uh, you see the same guy with the curly hair, you know. He's, he's approaching, and he's saying, uh, get off that blanket, you skinny weakling. And the George kicks sand in his face. And when the next thing you know, you see him hitting this guy, and this guy's falling over backwards. What happened to George? Oh, and you see, you know, his eyeball is hanging out. George is beating him. And underneath it, it says, yes, you can be the guy to kick sand in another guy's face. Just seven days. Well, I wonder how many guys out there tonight sent in a coupon. I mean, when you were a 26-pound weakling, had acne. You even had acne on your kneecaps. I mean, <laughs> that's a great thought. <laughs> and, uh, I wonder how many guys are listening tonight who send in for this thing, see? And the second day they got it, you know, they got this big spring with, a, with the hands on it, and they're standing in front of the mirror. <laughs> they're trying to get this thing working. Say, <laughs> and all of a sudden, way down inside, he's going... Now, for 42 years, you're known as old Hernia Harry. Dump, da dump, dump. Gee, what I have to do to earn a living, it's sickening. If my mother knew what I was doing. And by the way, uh, I often felt that uh, we're all going to have something to answer for one of these days. Do you see that cartoon in the New Yorker a couple of, couple of weeks back? It shows this guy in heaven. And uh, he's talking to another guy in heaven. they got these big wings. And they got a couple of, you know, harps. And one says, well, I'll tell you, you know what I think tipped the scales is uh, when I uh, when I started to boycott grapes. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> making bad noises here. Rah, 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 rah. Rah. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Sir. Here is what I wanted to do. I would like to salute over in Sayreville, New Jersey. I started to salute him a couple of days, and I never really finished. I listen to this. And Edison said, they sit down when their car, within their car, when they were buying this from this dealer, the couple, Mr. and Mrs. William McKenna, were told their new car would not be ready Monday. And, oh, they were told their new car would be ready Monday. It had not been serviced, and they wanted a car. So they sat in it, locked the doors, and refused to budge. Oh, you know, this is a... Uh, and, you know, this is a young mobile and all that. It's so sad to find people getting off to a bad start like that. They sat in it, locked the doors. McKenna said the dealer had been registered. The car had been registered by the dealer yesterday in his wife's name. It was promised to us today. A car is like a home. It's my property. Even though it's on their property, it's my property. And so now they had to they had a service the car. These two were sitting in there. They wouldn't get out. And I'd like to salute those. Do they know where it's at? After all of them. I mean, uh, you know, a car is more than a car. A car is a way of life. More than a car. It's a way of life. And in Jersey, it ain't much to choose from in the way of life. But uh, nevertheless, I, you're listening to a guy who had something to do that reminded me of something when I read that. You know, I, I suspect that one day there will be genuine sit-down strikes and there will be sit-ins that will involve cars. After all, a car is as much a part of a guy these days as his liver is. And, uh, oh, sure, car is a very important thing. And I, you are listening to a guy who was one of the very first people ever to witness a sit-down car demonstration. Yes, sir. And, and uh, you know, I've done a lot of things in my time. And I've uh, done some things that I regret. I've done some things. Not really. I, I can't honestly say I don't regret anything I ever did. Which shows how insensitive I am. <laughs> Shows what a rotten son of a gun I am. But uh, I, I really don't. I don't regret anything I've ever done. I wish I could. I wish I could write these long novels of guilt. I feel guilt about anything. I don't even feel guilt about the Indians. I didn't do it. I haven't even seen an Indian. I mean, how, can I work? how could I have done those bad things to the Indians? I mean, <laughs> I mean really. 
And so, so uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, there's a certain kind of guy that walks around. This is the Fletcher. And uh, he walks around, and he carries a load of guilt around with him, see, because it's so comforting. It's a big, big, fat load of guilt. He keeps it in a burlap sack and carries it over his back. Yeah, oh, yeah. And uh, he walks around and carries this. And once in a while, he trots it out. But do you see, he feels very, very uh, righteous if he carries this guilt with him. Now, that doesn't mean he does anything about it. He just carries the guilt. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so, so uh, oh, yes, I know, I know some of the... Some of the more, uh, some of the most affluent slobs I know that make. Uh, you remember that guy Reginald Van? What was his last name? The Great Gildersleeve. He used to do this uh, character. You remember he said, "Well, uh, I've been trying to get rid of my car like, you know, uh, uh, the ash trays were filled." What was that character's name? He did a show on, uh, on uh, it was a radio on TV show for a while. He was a rich guy, and he was he was he was supposed to be so rich he was obscene. And uh, you know, people would come, they would say something, there goes Regi- I think his name is Reggie or Reginald or something like that. And uh, they'd say, how are you? It's a hello. And they'd say, what are you doing? Well, Daddy uh, asked me to light a cigar, and I didn't have anything less than a $100 bill. And I had to use a $100 bill to light it. And, you know, uh, Daddy, uh, Daddy always says that you should never use anything over a $50 bill to light a cigar. And uh, he was very cross about it. You remember that? <laughs> Who was that guy? Anyway. I think it was I think it was somebody from the Great Gildersleeve. Somehow I related to the Great Gildersleeve. You remember the Great Gildersleeve? But somehow I relate that character to him. I know I may be wrong, but uh, I, I I remember as a kid hearing this show. And, and you know when when people talk about old radio shows, they always think that Shepard sits around and listens to Jack Armstrong. What I listened to was uh, was the Great Gildersleeve, <laughs> which I didn't hear very often. But when I did hear it, this guy would show up. I think. Now I'm not sure. In fact, I think eventually he had his own show. It was not Reginald Van Deesen. That's another character. This was a rich... He was a really a rich character. And uh, he was... He was, he, was a, he was a total slob. And he would say things like, Oh, my mommy just just was in a pet today. And the, the chief character of the show would say, Why? What, what's she doing? Well, you know how mommy is. Uh, mommy lost one of her diamond rings today. And uh, not that it makes any difference at all, but uh, you see the goldfish swallowed it. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. You remember that guy? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm but but uh, uh, I don't know how I got on the subject here, frankly. But uh, nevertheless, uh, we're all going, what are you writing in there so hurriedly? Is it the, uh, it does it have to do with this thing? No, I see. But uh, we're all going to have to answer for things one way or the other. And uh, you're listening to a guy who one time started a thing innocently. And I admit I don't have any guilt. I have no guilt. And I'm going to be very disappointed if I arrive at the great bar of justice and they make me, you know, yeah, that's right, point an evil finger of guilt at me, and I'm going to have to truckle. I'm not good at truckling. And, or or uh, whatever it is you've got to do when they point the finger of guilt at you. But one day I had this sponsor. And I'm going to tell you a story. I, I rarely tell you radio stories. But one day, no, I don't. I, I'm I'm uh, I'm just a kid in this this instance, and I'm going to college, and I had this summer job in a radio station, and I was doing all kinds of great shows. I had the, I had a man on the street show. I used to do the news. I used to play H. G. Grubbage in the news, and it was this this little tiny radio station. That we, it was the only seven watt radio station I ever heard of, you know. And we didn't even have an outside antenna. Uh, I'm serious. The radio station that I worked on did not have an outside antenna. And I'm telling you the truth. They used the the metal frame of the building that we were in as an antenna. And we used to broadcast uh, an area about, oh, maybe 15, 20 blocks. And, uh, yeah, a little tiny bitty station down there. We, we used to compete with the police calls for the ratings. And uh, we'd be way down at the bottom. And, and, and I was, you know, I never thought anybody listened. And so you get this feeling when you're, when you're working in a little bitty two-bit station like that. We had a Sears Roebuck. Uh, we had a, a Sears Roebuck crystal mic that came with somebody's tape recorder. And that was our microphone in the radio station. <laughs> Actually, it, I'm serious. It was, it was a little crummy station. And the, the engineer had built a board. And uh, you could see where he had taken it. We had a wooden panel on it, see? And he had polished it down. He tried to get it all off. You can just see the little imprint. It's a craft cheese. He made it out of old cheese boxes or something. It had big knobs on it. And, uh, it, yeah, well, it was a great, great little station. So, but nobody worried about whether they were being heard or not. See, our, our business in this radio station was not to get listeners, but to get sponsors. That's all. And a sponsor would last about three days, you see. 
on the station because he would, sh- he would shortly find out that he's the only guy listening, and he would tune in to hear his commercials. <laughs> so, so one day, I've got the show, and uh, I'd sit there and tell dirty jokes. and Because, uh, you know, nobody listened. It didn't make any sense. Even the FCC couldn't pick us up. So uh, I was on this little station all day long. And, and uh, I, I, all day long, I mean, I'd start out at 5.30 in the morning. I would open up. And uh, I would, uh, <laughs> and I would start giving the time. And uh, we had three records in the station. I keep playing them over and over again. There was one that was called uh, "Organ Salute to Gene Autry," and uh, yeah, it was a record that, that was an organ player, and he would he would play a medley of Gene Autry hits like "Maria Elena," and I would play that, and then I would uh, I would switch record, which uh, was Ella Fitzgerald singing "A Task at a Task at." And she would play, you know, she would sing that. And our last record, which which was our, our really best record, really, it was Kay Kaiser playing the Star Spangled Banner, and uh, with Jenny Sims singing the lyrics. So uh, those were our three records, which uh, I don't know where they got them, but those are the three. So I'd switch them back and forth, and I'd play them backwards, and I'd play them upside down and sideways. Sometimes I'd put a quarter on the pickup head, and uh, to make them sound scratchy. And other times, yeah, I was doing all kinds of stuff. And you get very loose when you're working in a station like that. So I, I, I was doing my own engineering. I had, to, had this uh, turntable. And we had a wind-up turntable. And, uh, yeah, it said Victrola on the side. And so uh, I, I'd get on the air every afternoon. I was sponsored by this Plymouth dealer in town for one brief period. Now, how in the world they ever got him on, I do not know. But this Plymouth dealer had <laughs> sponsored the show. <laughs> and and uh, he had, you know, he was a sad Plymouth dealer. And, and uh he had this he had this showroom, yeah, and, and yeah, he had the show, and all the time he was he was running these big specials, and they, and I would come on and I would announce the special, big special. Uh, anybody come in, it's a, it's our year end sale, all brand new models, and nobody'd show. So he's getting a little bit, yeah. Oh well, he's getting very discouraged, see. And so he would call me up every day after the show, and the phone would ring, and on would be this Plymouth dealer, and he'd say, uh, listen, uh, let's try a new approach tomorrow. I said, what do you mean, a new approach? Well, you know, he said, uh, there hasn't been anybody in here for a week. And uh, even the guy that greases the cars hasn't showed up this week, and I don't know what to do. And uh, I'm getting behind with everything else. Let's try another approach. We've got to get people in here. So I said, well, you know, I had to fake it. I couldn't say, well, how could, how, well, it wouldn't make a difference what I did, because there was nobody listening to me anyway. You know, it's like hollering out the window. Have you, ever, have you ever opened the window of your house and hollered a commercial out, friends? Well, I'll try it. And you'll find that you're not going to motivate many sales, and uh, not many people are going to listen to you. A few guys will laugh when you walk on the street. You'll try it. I mean, if you've really got a loud voice, you may get all the way down to the end of the block. And then uh, some lady, you know, who's out there beating the rugs may hear you give the commercial for biz or some uh, enzyme creative uh, uh, cleanser or something like that. But uh, uh, that's the kind of radio station we had. See, we, I might as well have been hollering out the window. It would have been cheaper. Then we wouldn't have had to pay the light bill and all that stuff, you know. <laughs> so... In fact, some days we just turn off the lights in, in the station and go for days without lights. And so one day he calls them. He says, hey, look, uh, uh, it's getting desperate, you know. Uh, I, I, you know, after all, we're, we're, we, we haven't even been able to pay our bill at the radio station. Now we owe you over $6, and uh, that's for 14 weeks. And uh, I don't know whether I'm going to sign for another another 13-week cycle, you know. I've been holding them off. After all, it's getting a little expensive. You want four dollars and a half for a thirteen-week cycle now, because with the rate discount, and I don't know whether I can pop for that, you know, because uh, I got to pay the guy that comes in and greases the cars once a week and all that. And we ain't sold the car since the last Michaelmas day. And I'll tell you what's worse: uh, we've got a whole lot full of clunkers, man. Uh, you know, back in the days when people bought cars for me, I took all these cars and used, and uh, I've got a whole lot full of them. I don't know what to do. And I got an idea. See, I, I'm being funny at first. And I said to him, I said, look, uh, I'm going to try something tomorrow. And uh, will you go with anything I try? He says, man, man, I'm, tell you, I'm, I'm sinking. The water's coming into the showroom already, and I'm telling you, we're bailing. Uh, it's, we're going down the drain. We only got two cars on hand, and uh, I had this one convertible here for eight months now, and it's got birds already growing in the, in the hood there. I mean, they're making nests in the grill, and I just ain't sold a car. I'll try anything, man. And I could tell he was on the verge of suicide, saying, a little bit we realized that we were about set history. We were. The two of us. Just like that. And so I called in the manager of the station, who also, by the way, was in charge of maintenance. 
Uh, he was in charge of uh, sweeping up. He was in charge of uh, sending out the checks. And uh, by the way, I hadn't been paid either for about seven months at that point. So uh, it, was, it was a really nitty-gritty radio right down at the bedrock. And, uh, yeah, once in a while, I remember I used to try to trip the manager uh, when he's going downstairs. We were on the third floor of this building, and we were above this sporting goods store where actually it was a front for a bookie joint. And uh, <laughs> he used to go out, run, run up and down there. And when, when, one of the, uh, when one of the sponsors would pay, like we get a check for maybe 2 or $3 in the mail, you know, for a big special we do or something like that, he would run down and he would try to lay it on a horse. And uh, yeah, yes, have you ever have you ever worked for a company that tried to you know its main investment was something that was running in Hagerstown, Maryland, which was twelve thousand miles away. Some plater, you know, would be running out there, and he would run down. He got the word down at the Bluebird Tavern that this plater was going to come in, say, and he would go running down the stairs, and he would put it on the on the on the nose. He always bet on the nose. This guy was a hell for leather type, you know, bet right on the nose. And about ten minutes later, he'd come dragging in, you say. And he's hocked his tennis shoes. And so he would go sit, and he, uh, it's the only radio station I ever worked in where the boss would go in his office, and you could hear him crying. And, uh, yeah, out loud. And so there was just me and him all the time. I was the only employee he had. <laughs> and, uh, well, outside of his sister-in-law. See, she would come in and, uh, on Sunday morning do the church programs. She had this high nasal voice. The sister-in-law would come in. And she, yeah, she, she always had flowers that were, that were attached to her shoulder. And I remember she would come in and she would sing, Rock of Ages, Cliff And uh, yeah, we were trying to do something to try to get the audience. You see, we'd ask for contributions. She'd say, the voice of the silver trumpet is asking for contributions from those of you who get solace of the word of God, which comes to you every Sunday at the same time. Rock of Ages. And she'd get maybe 15, 20 cents in every couple of weeks. People would send in. And so that was how we kept alive in this little nitty-gritty radio station. But little did we realize we were on the eve of a vast era of prosperity overnight. And it came as a result of a momentary inspiration, which I'm sure that one day I'm going to have to answer for. You have my Antile record in there? Get the Antile record. Uh, it's it's got It's got to be ready. Anti, and you cue it up. He's got it all set in there, and uh, you cue it up and do it fast because time is running short, and uh, you know how radio is. And so I'm sitting, I'm sitting in my little control room. Well, now <laughs> this 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 room that I was in. If you have any idea what radio studios and studios look like in general, this room that I was in, this had been apparently uh, it was a converted closet. I'm serious, it had been a closet. Apparently there had been an apartment up there years before. And they rented this apartment for about $9 a month. It was a real bad apartment. It was the only radio studio I've ever been in that had cockroaches running all over. And the, Yeah, they, they were still hanging around, you know, from the days when people were living there that ate, you know, and had food and stuff. And uh, they were hungry. Have you ever seen skinny, hungry cockroaches that, that used to go around looking real mad? I mean, you know, cockroaches live off garbage and stuff. Well, if you ain't eaten. And we weren't eating very good in that radio station. There wasn't much garbage, you know, except what went on over the air. And that was not very edible. And so we were really hungry. And uh, I, I, I remember one time the manager coming into the studio, this little tiny studio. And I'm on from 5.30 in the morning to 8.30 at night, seven days a week. It was a dawn-to-dusk radio station. And I used to use different voices because he wanted to make it sound, you know, like there were a lot of guys working there. And so I would say this. Uh, stay tuned now. It's 4 p.m., and in just 10 seconds, H.C. Grubbich, our special Washington correspondent, reports with his news and views on the world of news. The time now, in just five seconds, will be 4 p.m. at the sound of the tone. Then I would go, boop. I'm serious. I, I, we, we, didn't, we couldn't afford one of those electronic tones. I would go, boop. And then on would come H.C. Grubbich. And the way he came on was like this. I'd go, boop. Good afternoon, Americans everywhere. H.C. Grubbage reporting with the news. We, the taxpayers of America, once again are faced with another snow job from Washington. Have we been consulted on this? I say to you, Mr. President, and I say to you without equivocation that the taxpayers of America will demand an explanation of this latest bit of chicanery out of Washington. And so, that is my view for today. 
H.C. Grubbage speaking. Good night. I would say you've been listening to H.C. Grubbage, which reports each day at the same time. And people used to, you know, they liked him. And <laughs> so, so I played everything. I played, uh, I played Bullets McDurgan, uh, who reported with the sports. Oh, I used to have, I'd come out with the, with, with the sports theme. I would play, uh, oh, Wisconsin, we're playing for, I had the Wisconsin theme, and I would come out and say, and now it's time for the sports reports. This is Bullets McDurgan, your sports reporter. And tonight, we would like to take first a look at the National League. Uh, in the National League, sport fans everywhere. And I had all these great voices. Well, one day he comes in, the manager comes in, and I'm in the middle of queuing up the K. Kaiser record. And uh, he walks in, he says, hey, before you queue that up, we just got the deal with the white... I said, yeah? He says, yeah, they bought all the newscasts all day long. Well, I thought, I'm rich. I'm rich. See, he and I had worked on a deal where for every 15-minute newscast, I got an eight-cent talent fee if it was sponsored. So I figured it out immediately. Gee, that's, a, that's well over a dollar and a half a week. They bought all the newscasts. And so I, I immediately, I, I brightened up. And he says, wait a minute. I worked out a special trade deal. Oh, God. That's the worst thing you can hear in radio, a trade deal. I said, what kind of a trade deal? He says, you can have a hamburger free at the White Castle on Monday, Wednesday, and on Friday. And on Friday, they will throw in an orange shrink. Well, you don't look gift horses in the trap. You don't. And so you know what I did? You know, I needed cash more than I needed White Castle hamburgers. So I would go in and get my White Castle hamburgers on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And then I would stand out in front of the White Castle and sell them at cut rate uh, to the people that were going in. I'd say, hey, you want a hamburger? And, of course, they cost a dime in their sense. I got them here for eight cents, brand new hot. He says, they're hot, you know. The guy stole them. And, uh, you'd be surprised how much you could tell when you imply that they're stolen. So I was selling. But well, you don't want to hear this sordid uh, background. <laughs> I was going to tell you about what my, my big scheme was, wasn't I? Well, one day, I, I had this momentary inspiration. And so now I'm on doing this, uh, you know, Hartzell's Plymouth Dealer. So I says, and friends, uh, Hartzell Plymouth Dealer uh, is now running a special sale beginning Saturday morning at 7 a.m. All cars on his lot, used cars that he has selected, all used cars on his lot will be sold for $1.98. And then I went right on. You know, I played the K. Kaiser record. And the, it seemed like... Without any warning, I'm sitting in the studio for years. I have not had an audience. I have not even had something that I knew of, except the guy out at the White Castle who wanted to make sure I did the newscast before he gave me the hamburger. So I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden I could feel the ground shake beneath my feet. I could just feel the ground. You know, I hear people running down the streets. And I get up, you know, I got the K. Kaiser record on, and I go to the window, and I look out. The streets are black with people, all running down to Hartzell's Plymouth dealer. Thousands of them yelling and screaming and fist and running over each other. And I sat back in a chair, and almost instantly the phone goes, ah. And it's old Chet Hartzell. He says, what did you say? He says, what did you say? They're out in front of your guys are breaking the doors down. The fire department here, the cops are showing up. I said, what do you mean, Chet? He said, I don't know. What, what did you say? They're all yelling. They want a $1.98 car. What are you trying to do? I said, oh, Chet, no kidding. I'm just kidding. I said, I told him that any one of the clunkers on your lot that you would select, you'd sell for $1.98 beginning at 7 a.m. Saturday. That was a pregnant pause. He said, what? I said, they want those $1.98 cars. I, I'm just kidding. He said, that's fantastic. What a stroke of genius. Do you know that I was going to pay $10 a car to have these damn things towed away? He says, there's cars out there that have not moved since 1942. He says, they're nothing but junk. He says, we're going to get rid of them. You're a genius. A genius. It's fantastic. Well, people came for thousands of miles around. I'm telling you the truth. Thousands of miles. And that Saturday afternoon... There were something like four people had gone through Hartzell's Plymouth shop trying to buy $1.98 cars. And within six months, he was the biggest Plymouth dealer in that town. How's that for a happy ending? Which meant that he could afford to drop our contract and buy a 26-week contract on the big station right down the street. <laughs> How's that for a happy ending? 
And by the way, he later bought the station. Did he give me a job? Are you kidding? Are you kidding? The guy who used to grease the cars is now program director. Forget it, Prince. There's a happy ending to everything. So, uh... Oh, by the way, uh, here is, uh... Here is your assignment. Tomorrow, and I will be on. You listen, or I'll hit you. Okay?